Welcome to another episode of Technically Sleeping. Today we're going to discuss neonatal and pediatric anesthesia. Dr. Hassan and I both are uh, new puppy moms, so we thought this was a good opportunity to utilize our personal experiences with our puppies, but also um, give you guys a little bit more information about how to uh, sedate, anesthetize, and, and treat pain in these, in these patients because babies are not the same as adults. In terms of sources that I use for this presentation, uh, Lemon Jones, uh, the fifth edition 2015 version is a big one. The Snyder Anesthesia and Coexisting Disease book, that's really, really, really helpful. They're actually coming out with another version uh, within the next year or so, but I would highly recommend this book. It's, it's really great for looking up quick coexisting diseases and, and trying to get a good idea of how to anesthetize something with anything, uh, you know, within one of those categories. Um, there are a couple other articles that I use from Clinician's Brief, DVM 360 um, from University of Illinois that also have a lot of good resources on pediatric and neonatal anesthesia. In terms of fetal physiology, there's a lot of adaptations that a fetus utilizes in order to live in a hypoxic environment such as the womb. So the adaptations include the umbilical vein, the ductus venosus. Um, all, all mammals except for the horse and the pig have ductus venosus, um, and that's something that connects the uh, umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava and kind of bypasses uh, the hepatic vein a little bit. Uh, the foramen ovale, which is within the heart, the crista dividends, also within the heart, ductus arteriosus between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, and also the umbilical arteries uh, that go back to the placenta. In terms of fetal circulation, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how that, that works. So the umbilical veins take blood from the placenta and give it to the fetus. And what's important to recognize here is that this blood is actually fairly hypoxic. So there's not a lot of, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen in this blood is less than half of what a normal adult has in their arteries. So um, this is the highest uh, partial pressure of oxygen within the fetus within the fetal circulation system at any time, and it's only 30 millimeters of mercury. A normal uh, awake adult mammal, the partial pressure of oxygen in, in arterial blood is between 80 and 100 millimeters of mercury. So this is you know, uh, upwards of just over a third of that, depending on, on where you sit as an adult. But again, that they're used to hypoxic environments, and so this helps them. There's a lot of adaptations that we'll talk about that'll help them deal with that. So the blood from the umbilical veins mixes with the deoxygenated blood from the hepatic and portal veins, um, as well as uh, flows through the ductus venosus and the liver, and all of those drain into the uh, inferior vena cava, which also drains uh, the blood coming from the hind limbs. And the PaO2 of this blood now is about 25 millimeters of mercury. The inferior vena cava and superior vena cava, so from the head, uh, the superior and inferior is from the rest of the body, um, that those both drain into the right atrium. And so uh, their uh, partial pressure of oxygen is anywhere between 14 and 25 millimeters of mercury. So the oxygen rich blood will throw, flow through the crystal dividends, which is a, an adaptation with, between the right atrium and the, the left atrium. And that actually directs oxygenated blood through the frame and ovale. Um, and then that will flow into the left atrium and then into the left ventricle and go into the aorta, the brachial artery, and then directly to the head and the brain. So that actually has a fairly high uh, partial pressure of oxygen, around 25 millimeters of mercury. The rest of the blood will enter the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery, bypassing the lungs through the ductus arteriosus, and then enters the aorta through the ductus arteriosus. So um, that will mix with um, the rest of the blood in the aorta, go through the descending aorta, and then into the umbilical arteries in the hind limbs. And so the partial pressure there is anywhere between 19 and 22 millimeters of mercury. So again, we're looking at, um, you know, 20 percent of what normal uh, partial pressure of oxygen is, and that's what's getting to that, the hind limb of the body, and then also what's going back to the placenta to be picked up um, by, the mo by the mother and then returned to maternal circulation. In terms of the fetal heart, we'll uh, talk a little bit about um, the, uh, I'll show you here the, with using a pointer, um, we'll look at the crystal dividends again. So if you have blood coming from the vena cava, um, both the superior and the inferior vena cava, so the inferior vena cava has a little bit higher oxygen contents so that kind of uh, goes through the right atrium, but also into the crystal dividends and then through the foramen ovale, and then goes right here into the left atrium. Uh, the rest of the blood from the 
uh, superior vena cava comes down into the right atrium uh, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, into the pulmonary artery, and then through the ductus arteriosus to go right into the descending aorta. In terms of fetal physiology, uh, fetal oxygenation does depend on things like placental blood flow, the partial pressure of oxygen gradient between the, the mother and the fetus, uh, the ability of the placenta to diffuse oxygen and other nutrients through it, um, and the affinities of maternal and fetal hemoglobin. So they talk about the Bohr effect, which promotes unloading of oxygen at the level of the tissues based on pH. So it allows oxygen to dissociate from hemoglobin and be unloaded and utilized by the cells at the level of the tissues. Um, there are some texts that reference the double Bohr effect. And so that just, uh, just discusses how fetal hemoglobin and adult hemoglobin have um, different dissociation curves. So fetal hemoglobin is actually more um, affinitive for oxygen. It's going to hold on to oxygen a lot better than um, adult hemoglobin will. And so what happens is the adult hemoglobin is more likely to give off oxygen and he uh, fetal hemoglobin is more likely to pick it up, thus the double Bohr effect. The transitional period is actually uh, pretty interesting. So the fetus has been used to living in this hypoxic environment for so long, and then they come out and then they have to initiate this first breath. So that first breath is, is stimulated by the presence of hypoxemia and hypercapnia, as well as uh, the chemoreceptors within the fetus are highly sensitive to both of these things. So the fetal lung is actually not collapsed as most people think, it's inflated with liquid. So those that liquid is secreted by alveolar cells. And so that surfactant, um, and can, some of it can be squeezed out with, while they're in the birth canal, but this surfactant will help um, maintain open and stable alveoli once they're able to take that first breath. So they're gonna generate a hugely negative intrathoracic pressure. And so that's a negative 40 to a negative 100 centimeters of water. That's an enormously negative pressure for reference, to take a normal breath, the negative pressure generated in your chest is somewhere between eight and 15, uh, negative eight and negative 15 centimeters of water. So nothing like negative 40 to negative 100. So they have to take this massive breath and generate massive amounts of pressure in order to pop those alveoli open. But once they do, that surfactant will help stabilize those open alveoli. So again, those open alveoli, um, once those are open, that decreases the pressure in the pulmonary vascular system. So it decreases pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, thus the pressure in the pulmonary artery, the right ventricle and the right atrium all also decrease. Um, once the umbilical vessels rupture, they, they lose that low resistance circul uh, circulation circuit from the placenta. Um, this will increase systemic vascular resistance, increase aortic pressure and increase left ventricular and left atrial pressure. So if you have a decrease in right atrial pressure, an increase in left atrial pressure, that's going to reverse flow through that foraminal valley and that will shut the foraminal valley off. There's a flap on the left side, on the, uh, the left atrial side of that, and that will actually shut that flap um, due to the pressure switch where the left atrium is going to have more pressure and thus will try to drive blood across into the right atrium. And so that'll actually close that flap. It'll just kind of like a trap door um, that shuts it and then that closes that, uh, that shunt within the heart. Additionally, the, the ductus arteriosus, that aortic pressure is going to increase and that pulmonary artery pressure is going to decrease. And so that's going to try to reverse flow through that ductus arteriosus. Um, an increase in local oxygen concentration at the level of the ductus, as well as a decrease in circulating prostaglandins will actually have that ductus arteriosus close over time and they, it forms a ligament instead. It's no longer a vessel. So that's called a ligamentum arteriosum. And that's a fibrous band of scar tissue that was once the ductus arteriosus. So this video, I borrowed it from a children's hospital. It's going to tell you a little bit about how um, how this how this all works, um, and it's just a pretty short video. But I thought it was um, important to uh, give a little visual in terms of how things change uh, with the first breath. As soon as the cord is clamped, the ductus venosus ceases to carry blood to the heart, and it begins to constrict within the first few hours or days of life. The very first thing that happens when a fetus is born is it takes its first breath, the lungs expand, and so the resistance or pressure in the lungs drop, and that promotes blood flow into the lung itself. The ductus arteriosus begins to constrict and is typically fully closed within 24 to 48 hours of life, and blood is now then fully directed into the lung. As the blood returns to the left side of the heart after traversing the pulmonary circulation and picking up oxygen, pressure in the left atrium rises just a bit, and the trap door of the foramen valley, which was open before birth, now begins to close, usually within the first few days of life. As 
In terms of life stages, um, we it's fairly difficult and there are a lot of different schools of thought in terms of saying, oh, is this a neonate? Is this a pediatric patient? Is it adult? Is it geriatric? What have you? Um, so they typically think of neonates from uh, for birth to being weaned from their mother, pediatrics from being weaned all the way through sexual maturity, and then geriatric definitely depends on your uh, breed, the size of the patient, the life expectancy, and, and so forth. But keep in mind that the odds for perioperative mortality and small animal anesthesia are actually age dependent. So they have a decreased risk in anesthesia mortality for dogs and cats less than six months, but those patients that are older have a definite increase in risk. Again, age is not a disease, but it just comes with disease and it comes with comorbidities that we need to be at need to assess for in order to properly anesthetize those patients. The odds of anesthetic related casualties are actually higher in patients with coexisting diseases. So a sick neonate is obviously going to do um, have a higher risk and, and potentially do worse than a, a healthy neonate. So it, more importantly than age alone, the combination between life stage and physical status needs to be considered in order to make the most appropriate anesthetic protocol and keep this patient as safe as possible under anesthesia. I cannot emphasize this enough. This applies to every single patient that goes under anesthesia. It does not matter the species, does not matter who's anesthetizing it. More importantly than age alone, the combination between life stage and physical status needs to be considered. That will get you very far in anesthesia of any animal. These two tables I borrowed from uh, the Snyder book. Again, they kind of just define some of these feline life stages up on the top picture, and then the bottom table is, is uh, the canine life stages. In terms of neonatal physiology, some of the big highlighting points, and we'll go through some of the systems specifically, um, they are heart rate dependent for cardiac output. Um, so anything that affects heart rate in neonates will definitely affect their cardiac output directly. Uh, their different shunts can remain open. That's species dependent in terms of time and the likelihood that they're going to remain open for the rest of their life or just longer than a few days. For example, horses can have a PDA up to anywhere between 72 hours to a week, depending on the, the, the reference that you look at. They have low circulating proteins, a decrease in hepatic metabolism, an immature sympathetic nervous system, which means that their thermoregulatory abilities, their response to hypotension, all of those are affected. An immature endocrine system makes them difficult to regulate their blood glucose, their skeleton is immature, um, and then IV access that can be very challenging, right? So you have IO versus jugular versus umbilical vein. Um, a newborn, a, a freshly newborn animal, an umbilical vein is very easy, direct access um, to get something uh, directly into fetal circulation. So uh, if you have something that, that needs an IV treatment right away, an umbilical vein is, is a great option. In terms of cardiovascular, the neonatal circulation is a low resistance, high flow circuit. So they have a decrease in blood pressure, a decrease in blood volume, and a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance. You have to maintain things like heart rate and cardiac output, plasma volume, and central venous pressure or preload in order to maintain good cardiovascular circulation and perfusion to the organs. Baroreceptors, the things that respond to changes in blood pressure, they don't mature until 12 weeks of age. So that's gonna be critical for those first three months. If you have to anesthetize something that's, that's younger than three months of age, realize that those baroreceptors do not respond the same. They have a decreased ability to vasoconstrict, thus heart rate being the drive for cardiac output. Um, and bradycardia is actually typically mediated by hypoxemia and not vagal response. So any puppy or kitten that's bradycardic, especially very young ones, those are likely patients that are struggling for oxygen over being uh, highly inundated with vagal tone. Again, their sympathetic nervous system is not necessarily uh, completely developed at that time, and thus they won't be able to generate a sympathetic or parasympathetic response similar to adults. Uh, congenital heart defects can be found in 17% of dogs and about 5% of cats. So um, SAS, so subaortic stenosis and PDAs in dogs, um, and tricuspid valve dysplasia and uh, ventricular septal defects are seen most commonly in cats. In terms of blood pressure, uh, puppies, they did a study on uh, looking at mean arterial pressure in healthy puppies, and around two months of age, there it's around 49 millimeters of mercury, and then at nine months of age, it's more normal, around 94 millimeters of mercury. So you can tolerate a lower MAP in these patients, depending on their age, but remember that a lower blood pressure um, comes with some other consequences. So there is also less renal autoregulation for maintaining things like renal blood flow and, and GFR, and so they directly decrease when blood pressure decreases. So volume in these patients is very, very critical because they are very sensitive to hypovolemia and dehydration. In terms of respiratory function, uh, the development of respiratory function occurs before birth but matures in the postnatal period. The neonatal and pediatric rib cage is more compliant. The intercostal muscles are weaker. They have an increased work of breathing and an increased pressure required to maintain tidal breathing, especially in neonates. So they're likely to get very exhausted, especially if you have to anesthetize a very, very, very young animal. The respiratory chemoreceptors are immature. They're less sensitive to things like changes in CO2 or oxygen partial pressure within the blood. 
Young animals have an increase in respiratory rate and increase in minute ventilation, and they have a greater tendency to develop atelectasis. They have a greater demand for oxygen and a decrease in functional residual capacity. This means that they're very susceptible to things like respiratory fatigue and hypoxemia during anesthesia. The maximum functional lung efficiency in dogs occurs at the age of one year. So they don't have maximal functional lung efficiency until a year of age in dogs. In terms of hepatic and renal, the CYP450 system, so that's an enzyme system that's used to metabolize many anesthetic drugs and many other drugs that uh, we give our patients, this is immature. So we have a decrease in drug metabolism and possibly a prolonged drug elimination period. The decrease in glycogen stores and decreased ability to generate new glucose molecules, that it can result in hypoglycemia when they're stressed or fasted. They have an immature endocrine system, which also contributes to this problem. Their liver isn't considered fully mature until around 10 weeks of age. In terms of the renal system, nephrogenesis is incomplete until three weeks of life in puppies. They have a decrease in clearance rate, a decrease in GFR, renal plasma flow, a decrease in filtration fraction, uh, depressed reabsorption of things like amino acids, phosphates. They have exaggerated naturesis, so they get rid of sodium faster than normal adult patients. They have low concentrating ability, and they can even have glucose urea until eight or nine weeks of age. What does this mean? It means they can lose volume through their kidneys very easily. They're very sensitive to volume, they're very sensitive to hypovolemia, they're sensitive to electrolyte changes because their kidneys can't function to reabsorb those things or change the concentration within the blood because they're not really mature right away. An increase in phosphorus because they're growing, but also an overall decrease in creatinine and BUN. So neonates really get azotemic because they have normally low BUN and creatinine values. And so even if they're dehydrated and, they, uh, and those values do elevate, they'll still elevate to within the normal reference ranges that you see on your blood work. So you won't, you, they will never develop a severe azotemia because of that. Again, adult renal function doesn't happen until around eight weeks of age. In their central nervous system, uh, it actually takes a decrease in drug levels to produce effective general, local, and uh, neuromuscular blocking agent anesthesia due to immature uh, central nervous system as well as immature neuromuscular junction. You have to adjust the doses of all these drugs. Adjust your dose of general anesthetics. Adjust your dose of local anesthetics. Adjust your dose of neuromuscular blocking agents because they don't need as many to produce the same effect. Again, their thermoregulatory center is weakened. They're more susceptible to anesthesia-induced hypothermia which can result in things like bradyarrhythmias, a decrease in MAC and shivering. Don't forget that shivering increases oxygen consumption. Refer to Dr. Hassan's lecture on hypothermia. It can cause very negative side effects, and these patients are specifically, specifically susceptible to this. They have a loss of heat readily because they have a high surface area to body mass ratio. They have decrease in fat stores, and they have an inability to shiver until they're greater than six days old. So they are very susceptible to hypothermia, and that can actually cause significant problems in the perioperative period. Keep in mind the hypothalamus is also immature in newborns. They can't regulate their heat very well. So you have to be constantly aware of their, ability, of their temperature and this will also help you promote a better recovery period um, if you have a patient that's undergoing anesthesia for a procedure. In terms of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, they have a lower albumin uh, level and they have lower albumin to drug affinity. This decreases protein binding and pharmacologic uh, uh, agents and they also have a more permeable blood brain barrier. So you have an increase in uh, unbound drug, which increases the drug effect. You have a decreased need for a dose, so that'll automatically make your drugs more effective, and you have a higher blood brain barrier permeability. So you have all these things that are working against this patient to make it more susceptible to the effects of the drugs. So you have to be very aware of your dosing when you dose these patients. Um, a higher body water content and a lower fat content will have a greater initial volume of distribution for those drugs that are water soluble and a less volume of distribution for those drugs that are lipid soluble. Um, they have a faster rate of induction or a rate of change with inhalant anesthetics. This is due to the larger ratio of alveolar ventilation to FRC. So in neonates, it's five to one, while in adults, it's 1.5 to one. So it's a significant change. So anytime you change that dial, that'll change in that fetus or in that neonate a lot faster than it will in an adult. They also have an increased fraction of their cardiac output going to vessel rich organs like the brain, the heart, the liver, the kidneys, and they also have an increased cardiac output per kilogram. So all those things kind of uh, factor into the fact that they will have um, an, uh, a faster rate of change induction or, or just changing the dial of your inhalant anesthetics. They also have a lower blood gas partition coefficient, which just means that inhalants can get into their blood a lot easier. Other little things, um, don't forget in, on your blood work, ALP, calcium, and phosphorus, those are all usually high due to growing, uh, growing babies, growing bones. GGT can be high from colostrum 
so if they got good colostrum, GDT can sometimes uh, be high on blood work from that. Um, albumin, hematocrit, and total solids are always going to be low. So puppies and kittens have about a 25 to 30 percent hematocrit. So if you're seeing a puppy or a kitten with a, a higher hematocrit, like in the 35s or even closer to 40, that patient is likely quite dehydrated and quite volume underloaded. So keep that in mind when you're looking at this blood work, these blood work values. Um, making sure that you're assessing these patients for congenital abnormalities. If you need to anesthetize something because it has one of these congenital abnormalities, looking for the problems associated with that are important, right? So a cleft palate, a cleft lip, that can result in aspiration pneumonia. PDA, tetralogy of flow, that puts those patients at a very high cardiovascular risk. Um, umbilical hernia, if we have something that we have intestines that have herniated into this umbilical hernia and need surgery right away, you have to keep in mind that you could have other congenital abnormalities that you're either missing or you haven't assessed for before you anesthetize the patient. Um, during growth and development, uh, portosystemic shunts, um, as well as uh, the notation of something like a PDA, tetralogy of flow, those things can, can definitely pop up. Um, again, just talking about body water content, their higher respiratory rate, higher metabolic rate, and an increased total body water content, as well as the inability of the kidneys to concentrate urine and concern water, means these guys are easily dehydrated and easily affected by hypovolemia. In terms of IV access, it, these can be very challenging to provide uh, IV access for. So looking at smaller gauge catheters, you can use a cephalic catheter. Um, uh, a jugular catheter is really great. Uh, you can even just use a regular 20 or 18 gauge uh, IV and suture that into the jugular vein. Um, this is helpful for sampling, but uh, don't forget about IO is still an option. So you can use something like the wing of the ilium, the humerus, the femur, um, all those are good viable options. And just a hypodermic needle should be enough because their bones are still pretty soft, at, um, especially when they're pretty young. Um, I can't really emphasize enough the use of Emla cream. This is a eutectic mixture of lidocaine and prilocaine. You just um, apply this over the shaved skin and then cover that with saran wrap for 30 to 40 minutes prior to trying to place an IV catheter. It helps numb the skin and it helps them um, not fight so badly when you're trying to get an IV catheter into an awake patient. Um, it makes all the world of difference. Um, I can't really emphasize this enough. If you have the time to do this, it really, really, really helps. Um, and it definitely helps with uh, them not struggling so much. You're le less likely to blow a vein, um, and it's, it's pretty great. Obviously, don't let them lick it, so you cover it with saran wrap so that it absorbs into the skin, um, and it, I think it makes a big difference. In terms of other equipment and airway management, uh, a non-rebreathing circuit is required for these guys. They're too little to move the valves on a, a rebreathing circuit. Um, you might have to provide ventilation for them. So if you don't have a ventilator that's small enough to ventilate these really tiny patients, making sure that you can provide breaths for them is important. Um, intubation is, can be pretty tricky, especially when they're small, like this little kitten here. And you can see that there's a significant amount of dead space um, within, this, uh, within this circuit. So you look how long this tube is sticking out of this cat's um, you know, this cat's mouth, and this is actually a, a portable capnograph that's on the end. This is very, very heavy. So the, this cat actually could easily, very, very easily get excavated because of the weight of all these things on the endotracheal tube in the circuit. Um, so you can use uh, sizes, uh, really small endotracheal tube sizes, um, a long uh, 14 or 16 gauge catheter, a red rubber catheter, a stylet is really critical. You can use a, um, a jugular catheter wire. Some of those are nice and non-traumatic. They have a nice dull end to them. Some of those are really helpful to keep these really tiny tubes that are so flimsy uh, stiff enough to intubate. They have a pretty um, sensitive larynx. Their larynx can be very easily traumatized, so being very gentle and having a patient appropriately relaxed, good lighting, a good laryngoscope blade. Um, and then if you're going to place lidocaine on the larynx, like we do in most cats, be aware of potential overdose of that lidocaine, because even a couple drops of 20% lidocaine is going to be, you know, close to the toxic dose for a really small kitten. So either dilute your lidocaine or just be very aware of how much you're placing on the larynx, because that systemic uptake, again, can be toxic, especially to cats. In general, for neonatal anesthesia and pediatric anesthesia, reversible drugs are some of the best options. Um, alpha-2 agonists uh, have to be for specific ages, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I avoid ketamine, especially in super, super young uh, patients. It's okay in pediatrics, but not as much as neonates. They just have an immature sympathetic nervous system, and since ketamine is a sympathetic stimulant, it's less, like, it's less indicated for these patients. Um, but don't forget you can tolerate a lower blood pressure. So MAP in the 50s is something that we're okay with, especially in, in patients less than six months of age. So when can we get desmetotonin? Um, in cats, uh, cats greater than 12 weeks of age and dogs greater than 16 weeks of age um, are 
or what's on the label dose for dexmedetomidine. Um, but in terms of pain meds, don't forget that NSAIDs are a great pain medication. Um, carprofen is labeled for anything greater than six weeks of age. So if you have that two month old puppy with an RU fracture, carprofen is a great, great, great source for that because they are able to handle it at this time. Um, it's labeled for them and it does provide a significant amount of analgesia. Don't forget about things like opioids and gabapentin, both of which can be compounded small enough for these little babies. In terms of anesthesia, a pre-anesthetic evaluation is pretty important. So in super neonates, a neuro exam and oral exam, making sure that they don't have a cleft palate or anything like that would be pretty important. Uh, pediatrics, in looking into family history of congenital diseases, observe things like arterial pulses, signs of cyanosis, listen hard for a murmur, um, look at their respiratory rate and effort, uh, look for things like jugular venous distension, ascites, hepatomegaly, um, making sure you get chest rads and an echo if any of those things are indicated. In terms of sedation, um, neonates typically don't need a lot of sedation, if any. Um, again, no alpha 2s in those patients at all. Um, pediatrics can, use, can typically withstand mild sedation, so benzos and opioids, alpha 2s if they're old enough. But everybody needs to be pre-oxygenated and then uh, anticholinergics can be administrated, administered uh, to support their heart rate, uh, especially if you're worried about them becoming more bradycardic. Uh, don't forget again about analgesia. So uh, not, you know, less than 100 years ago did they paralyze human babies to do open heart surgery on them because they didn't think their pain pathways were actually fully developed. So um, some people don't, uh, still don't think that pain pathways in neonates are fully developed, but they have been proven scientifically to develop late in gestation and they're fully developed by, um, by the time that they're born. So they, this pain and distress that can be associated with surgery early in life can actually disturb things like eating, sleeping, um, uh, different maturation stages. And so pain perception is very, uh, is something that we are very, very aware of, and that should be something that we take care of on, on all aspects, no matter the age of your patient, no matter what's getting done, making sure that they have appropriate analgesia is very critical because it does affect them later in life. Um, don't forget that, that these patients have a decreased dose requirement for local regional anesthesia. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use it, just adjust your dose. In terms of induction and maintenance, um, some neonates, um, they will mask down because they are unable to get uh, you know, venous access or what have you. Again, we've discussed ways to get venous access in these guys. Um, intubation can be difficult. Um, monitoring can be challenging. They're so small. So monitoring equipment that's used on humans is really difficult to utilize on small kittens or puppies. Um, they'll likely need help with breathing because they can fatigue very easily. But this ventilator here, this is called the Hallowell Workstation. This can ventilate something as small as a mouse. So you can actually ventilate a kitten or a puppy on this uh, ventilator. And they can also self-ventilate while they're on this so you can turn it on and off as you're needed. Um, don't forget that uh, things like dissociatives can have a higher mortality rate in neonates. Um, things like atomidate and other uh, drugs that have high protein binding can have a higher potency in these patients. So again, decreasing your drug doses for neonates and pediatrics is, is definitely appropriate because you can always give more, right? It's kind of hard to take away some of these drugs, but you can give more if you decide that you need more. Uh, don't forget about warm fluids. Um, uh, dextrose supplementation if possible or if necessary, monitoring things like temperature, blood glucose, or all those things are, are very important. Don't forget that you're using heparin, if you're using heparin saline or even just saline in general, don't overload them with uh, too much fluids, don't overload them with too much heparinized saline, especially because they're going to be more susceptible to problems with that. Um, so if you're usually using three or six mil syringes for flushes, maybe make smaller syringes or make special separate ones for your, your tiny babies. Um, again, propofol and atobinate have a higher potency, um, in, especially in pediatric and neonates. Um, avoiding hypothermia is very critical. Um, in terms of recovery, neonates in the first three days of life have a, a respiratory reflex where if you stimulate their umbilical or their region or their genital region, that'll actually cause respiration. So that can help you recover them and help them start to breathe on their own in recovery. But making sure you provide heat, check glucose, returning them to eating is very, very critical. So all these things are important for uh, recovering a neonate or a pediatric after an anesthetic procedure. So I'll share some example protocols. Um, I, I struggle, and Dr. Hassan also struggles too, with implying a, a protocol as a blanketed approach to choosing anesthetic drugs for a patient. So we strongly advise choosing an individualized protocol for each patient for each anesthetic event. So we believe that specific doses, routes, and combinations should be considered carefully for each patient in its individual state. So no blanket protocols, no, we give this to every single puppy or kitten. You need to look at every patient, look at its, um, its age, its physical status, its comorbidities, anything else that's going on, and then what procedure you're getting, because that is going to determine what drugs that it really needs, right? 
So pre-medications, opioids, plus or minus a benzo are always a good idea. So butorphan if you need more sedation versus methadone um, if you need, or hydro or fentanyl if you need something that's better for pain relief. Um, midazolam as your benzodiazepine, again, that's really great. Um, again, all these things can be reversed. Dexmedetomidine, depending on the age and the route, you can use this on our older pediatric patients for sure. Um, induction with propofol or alfaxone, considering a co-induction, a little bit more of a benzo, um, especially if pre-medication is incredibly sedating. Sometimes you need an extra co-induction to decrease how much propofol or alfaxone that you're giving them. Um, they can maintain on inhalant. Don't forget that if you change that dial on the inhalant, it's going to change pretty quickly within that patient. So turning them down, may, they may actually wake up on you um, more so than an adult would because that, that concentration within the lungs is going to change a lot faster. Uh, you can still use CRIs if applicable. Just keep in mind what kind of volume you're putting into this patient. So if you're using many, many CRIs and fluids, you could have the potential to volume overload the pet. The pet. Um, monitoring is pretty standard. Heart rate, ECG, respiratory rate, end tidal CO2, uh, pulse oximetry, blood pressure, temperature, blood glucose, as well as anesthetic depth. Um, consider things like the weight on the endotracheal tube, the weight of the circuit, um, a significant amount of dead space is going to affect your monitoring, going to affect the ability of the patient to ventilate on its own, um, as well as affect the ability to ventilate off any of that CO2. Um, these patients can be really difficult to monitor, difficult to get equipment to uh, to main, remain on the patient, so try not to get frustrated. Uh, a Doppler is a great way to get multiple things. It can help you with heart rate. You can use it uh, to get Doppler blood pressures. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that you can have on there to kind of give you, you know, two separate monitoring uh, values. For recovery, don't forget about active warming, checking your glucose, returning them to feeding as soon as they um, are able. And then analgesia is really, really important. So NSAIDs, if they're able to have them, opioids like buprenorphine or hydromorphone, gabapentin, all those things are really critical to help them uh, mitigate pain in the perioperative period. Um, and again, don't forget local regional anesthesia. If you can block these patients, ideally we should try to block them. Adjust the dose down. So if you're usually using a make per kick of bupivacaine, maybe decrease it to half a make per kick of bupivacaine um, when you're using that block. So just be aware of how much, uh, what kind of dose of drugs you're giving, what kind of things are going into your block. Um, but I think this can't be underemphasized because it's going to help you maintain that patient under anesthesia much, much better because the MAC production is so phenomenal with local regional anesthesia. So in conclusion, neonates and pediatric patients have different adaptations and physiologic changes that make their anesthetic maintenance and monitoring different from that of adult animals, right? They're not small adults. They have different needs, different uh, nuances that make them a little bit more difficult to anesthetize. So care and consideration should be taken to ensure a safe perioperative period for these patients and a uh, through a thorough understanding of their differences in physiology in comparison to their adult counterparts. Focus on things like providing heat support, administering short acting and or reversible drugs, maintaining blood glucose and short procedure times. Those are all very critical to making this a more successful anesthetic event for, for these patients.